Rock and roll. Here we are at Road Poets Studio in it, um, Beverly's uh, Bevcam. I got to get that straight. So you send me a letter and tell me which it is. But you know, we're glad you're out there because this is the one show that invites you, the viewer, to come and be on. If you sing, dance, juggle pianos, tap, dance across the stage, pogo stick across the live wire, we want you to get a hold of us because I think that cable TV is one of the greatest things there is because it opens the door for everybody out there to be on. You know what I mean? And it's great when, when you can say, like, you know, your grandchildren can see you, you know, or your great-grandchildren. This is incredible. We want you, and if you, like I said, it, and I'm, if you're a writer, too, because writers are one of our favorite kind of people. And tonight, we have two great kinds of people. We have Jeff McGraw, mm -hmm. who is a micro-publisher, and Bruce. NATO. NATO. I got that right, man. <laughs> yes, you did. But I was just going to say, Bobby NATO used to be a good friend of mine here in Beverly. And, you know, it, it's great that you two are hooking up and you're going to start publishing things. And, and, you know, and we don't sell nothing here, so there's no call to action. Okay. But I'm sure if somebody wanted to find out how to be on, you know, get their work published, you know, because it's all going to be PG. It's all going to be, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, God. You know what I mean? Because I'm not into it. I'm not mm. a shock. A lot of people get up on the stage and they got to shock you and wig you out. And You know, I want to entertain you. I, you know, and I, and I want people to come on the show to be able to entertain and edify, as they say. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, I mean, we're, we're excited to be on the show with you. I think it's yeah. something that's a neat opportunity. It's something that'll... Uh, uh, help us clarify what we're trying to do and help us understand a little bit about um, uh, what you're doing with the show. It's pretty interesting what you're working on. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Mike Evis is the, on the camera crew tonight. Mm -hmm. He was with us back in the 90s down the old TV station when Sally Lee was on. Sally Lee writes kids books. She's, okay. she's an illustrator, but she'd really never really published much before she came on the show. You know, this is the first step to somewhere home. Well, it's kind of interesting. Bruce had been working on his stories for a while. Um, <clears throat> he, we go ahead. I was say I, I have two small children, and um, you know, it, it, any parent will tell you: you tell a tale, you tell them a story, and it just uh, by chance, one of them really struck with my daughter, and she kept asking me more questions. Well, what did this character do? What did this person do? And I, I said, you know, maybe this is the sign that I need to write one down, and. Uh, I started doing them, telling them the story, and of course it was just going to be a one-time deal. It was never going to do another one. And uh, she loved it. And a couple weeks later, all of a sudden, I was like, I, I, I have another idea. I, I, I think these characters are going to do a little more. And uh, one day I was at work. Jeff stopped in to say hi and uh, basically caught me drawing and said, okay, come on, a, an adult drawing a picture. What, what are you doing? I said, well, don't laugh. I wrote a story for my daughter and I'm illustrating it. And uh, he took one of the previous ones with him home and he after came teasing you for a few minutes. after teasing for a few minutes because yeah. again I was a grown adult drawing a picture um, my little colored pencils and getting right in there um, and he enjoyed the story and he said you know this this is good we have to do something with this mm -hmm. and uh, you know I I didn't know what the next step was um, I was kind of the a little I, I like to think a little more in the creative type uh, he's more of a business guy and he said well you know what I'm gonna find out how do we do this yeah. and uh, that's how it kind of started off yeah, we sort of looked at each other and tried to figure out what we knew about publishing, and neither of us really knew a lot, and we said, let's learn together, and we just jumped into the deep end, and we started I mean, going. You, you know, there's something magic, too, about when you read to your kids. Now, I don't think it's just about the words. Mm -hmm. Th this goes back eons and eons. Absolutely. You know, like, can't you just see many, many, many years ago, you know, like cavemen sitting in the cave, and little children saying, Grandpa Og... Will you tell us a story? Once Absolutely. there was some bulls. Well, what do they look like? And he picks up the thing and he starts drawing on the wall, pictures yep. of the yep. bulls. Absolutely. We still got them out there, but I'm not going to crawl in the cave to see them. Yep. But you know what I mean? That's probably where it started. Absolutely. You know what I mean? That long ago. You know, so the, and the story, it, it's just something about it. And you know what I mean? And how old is your child again? Um, my daughter is now nine, um, the one that I started writing the stories for because. My son was only one at the time, and you know, most of his stories were the single word, the, the color, the picture. Um, he now is four, and I have to tell you, it's, it's heartwarming to me. He is just as excited about the picture books that I started mm -hmm. doing for her at her young age. He is just as excited about him now. 
She, however, has become more challenging as she's now nine, an independent reader. Uh, I've kind of had to go out of the picture books and chapter books and stories and multiple layers to the story to keep her interested, but God love her, she keeps asking for more and she keeps asking when's the next one going to be ready. Uh, I just hope she doesn't run out of interest before I run out of ideas. Yeah. So You're relatively young. They're relatively, in the standing of things, uh, 44. 44, no, the reason I'm saying is because, like, you know, when we look at our children, we, we think of an age. But the real truth of the matter is, someday you'll probably be a grandfather, and you know what I mean, you know, you know like, they will be reading those to your grandchildren. And, and, you know, that was, I think that was what was so exciting the first time I read my son, the story I had written for my daughter, that he was just as excited as she was. And I, it, it was kind of the realization that it wasn't just a one-time story. Mm -hmm. It can go on. And, of course, since this time, um, I can tell you that my daughter has given books as birthday presents. She's gone to birthday parties for her friends and given the books, and the kids have really enjoyed the stories, and it, it's, it's just kind of fun. It's, it's nice to know, you know, when you, when you write a story, you're a little afraid that, okay, the kids only like it because they're the ones it was written for, mm -hmm. but to have other kids like it as well really kind of feels good, and it lets me know that maybe I am on the right line. Maybe I am doing something right. Yeah. And, and one of the things that was actually, I thought was very interesting and actually quite endearing, I don't know if that's the correct word, but when we got the first book published and got the first print back and we were actually holding it in our hands, and we started looking at each other grinning and saying, this is a real thing, and then we sort of stopped and looked at each other and was like, well, you know, even if this book doesn't sell a million stories, you know, it's still out there, it's still published, you know, 150 years from now, someone could do some looking and Googling and maybe track this down on Amazon's, you know, long tail archive of books that have been sold. That's kind of cool to me. The story still exists. Yeah, yeah. the stories will be still, are still there. They're out there and people will tell you to see them. That's pretty cool to me. I, I come from the old vaudeville thing. It doesn't make any difference. How many people are in the audience? You're still there to entertain one, twenty, yeah. fifty. I've read up to 150 people in the room. You know what I mean? And That's I've also lot. end up showing up with my crew. You know what I mean? The Highway Poets would be about eight of us, mm -hmm. and the audience isn't half as big as the Melbourne <laughs> is. It's, it's the truth. But you know, you still get up. You still present your show. Yeah, you're getting your message you, you out there. I mean? so well, and, and that's one of the things I reminded myself um, when, when Jeff brought in the first proof and it arrived. And I just completely froze seeing my name printed. You know, not just something I wrote on it, but yeah. printed. And I, I did, I froze. Um, and then I realized, no, ultimately this was all about getting my kids the stories I wanted yeah. to give them. And even if no one else ever reads them, they're still going to get their stories. Yep. And, and they are the audience that I was going for. Um, and like I say, the fact that others seem to be enjoying them well is great, but still, they're the ones that I'm, they're, they're my ultimate critics. They're the ones I have to answer to first. Exactly, exactly. To me, ego and humility, you know, those are always two things that, in, in a, it seems like a lot of times what people don't have in talent, they make up with ego, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But real humility to me is when you can pick something up and judge it on its own value. It isn't great because you wrote it. It's either good or yeah. it isn't. Yeah. And it isn't, some people have that in reverse. They, they can't believe they can do anything well. Yep. And really, it's like, you know, look, you'd be amazed. That this is something that's always amazed me. 90% of the people who think, you know, that, that have something they want to do, they want to draw, right. they want to write, they want to play some, 99% of them have talent because that's why they have that little flicker inside them. Right, exactly. You know, of yeah. hope to do that. Yeah, you have a calling to do something to write stories. It's, yeah. you know, I, I think it would be neat to write stories, but I don't spend time writing stories and drawing, you know, illustrating stories. That's not something that's called to me. You know, that's something that calls to Bruce and... You know, he likes to write the stories, and I like, you know, I thought it would be fun to learn how to publish books. I'm, I'm a big reader. I've always been a big reader, and it's something that allows me to work around books and, you know, work on something with my friend. And, you know, we're getting stories out there and telling positive messages to kids. Um, but as you said, I don't have that spark to be the writer, which makes it easy for us. I say, and it's actually perfect for us because, well, I do have, I like to think, a creative spark. Um, I like to get the stories out. I, I really had no idea how to take the next step. I really didn't know what the next step was. Everyone and is important. Yeah, exactly. You, you, 
if we didn't have these great camera people and the people out in the booth and the editors mm -hmm. putting it together, we'd all be sitting here looking at each other doing nothing. And that wouldn't you know, be any fun. Everybody yeah. is important. Absolutely. That, that's why you bring the magic. You bring the magic in the end. It's like without that, I mean, I, I came from the writing when, believe me, it was if you really wanted to put something out, you had to either go find an old mini graph machine, mm -hmm. you know, and put out a bunch of copies on yep. it. I was plugged into stuff back in the 60s when we were doing it that way. And today, the technology is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. But without somebody, <clears throat> somebody with that final, to punch the key, to send it to the, to the printer, to bring it back, yep. it's lost. Well, it's interesting that you say it that way, and I... It, sort of sounds like a canned segue, which it's not, but that sort of feeds into the first book that we put out, which was the, the Babri the Pirate book. And Bruce was writing the story on something that would be positive for kids. And the theme of the story is how teamwork and uh, teamwork among people is what's required to make something positive happen. So you have different char characters. Absolutely. And everyone does something different and everyone is good at something different. Absolutely. Um, and they, they work together if you want to describe it. Could you hold up one of the covers? Absolutely. The biggest one would be the best probably. Can we zero Absolutely. in on that a little bit? Which was, you know, I mean, without the team, it don't happen. Without the team here, it doesn't exactly. happen. Exactly. You know? Absolutely. And, and like a while ago, my friend Nate was on here. He's a gospel singer. And he was on and he sang, you know, gospel. And we're walking in. I'm walking into some place and he's got his daughter with him. And she goes, oh, you have a wonderful sh TV show. Yeah. Well, because her father was on it. Yeah, you, you know have. I mean, it, it, it's really, you know, and of course, as we're saying that word endearing, children get endeared to certain characters. Exactly. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It, 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 it's just, I remember when I was a kid, which is many, many, many moons ago, TVs were about that big. I you remember know, that, and, yeah. And, you know, it was Beanie and Cecil. You know what I mean? It was, but it's always going to be something. And when you're the person bringing it to them, you become a very important person. Be it the production, be be it the actual writing. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's and, and the real reason this show we're doing this show is for people out there just like you folks who want to do something but they can't quite get it together. Yep. They really can't, oh, nobody's going to pay attention. It isn't that important. Who's going to really listen to me? No, we're going to listen to the people out there. We, we want them to come and be on our show. Yeah, that's one of the things, and I, you sort of hit on something that to me is sort of close to my heart, is there's a lot of people out there that have dreams and aspirations, and I. this is what caught Bruce, you know, caught me trying to get Bruce to publish the books or trying to work with Bruce to get the books published is he's like, you know, I'd like to publish these and it's, I'd like to try to get this done. And, you know, we just decided to jump in with both feet. And there's so many people, I'm sorry, no, no, there's so many people that have things that they want to do. And, you know, whether it's, you know, go back to school or start a business or talk to that girl, you know, I, we're both very married, but, yeah. you know, talk to that girl or talk to that boy or do whatever they want to do. And they're just afraid. And, uh, you know, the ability, even if you jump and miss or fail 50 times, you know, this is America and you can fail 50 times and still be, a, you know, you're still a success until you quit trying. The, the jumping and missing is still better than never jumping Absolutely. at all. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry. I could get very excited about this topic. Yeah, but we all do. Yeah, all I'm do. sorry. But now, yeah. Do you, yeah. Do, sorry. Do you have a web page? Do you have a... We don't have a web page. We, have a, we are working on the web page yeah. for uh, nadupress.com. Um, but we do have a Facebook page just yeah. under uh, Facebook backslash Nadu Press. Press. And yeah. we post there one or two times a week and we, we try to keep updates for what's going on with the books. A little, little bit about some new characters, some when we're looking for the new book to come out, and just some, um, you know, just trying to, to keep in touch um, so people can at least follow what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. No, the reason I'm asking, because the people out there, because one thing I do know about you, you're not. You know, like my friend who owns the place, he says, I only want you to do three things today. Sell, sell, sell. Ah. You know what I mean? And that's not really the attitude here. What we're doing is helping people. Right. And But one thing I kind of know about you, even you're willing to help another person. Absolutely. Talk to another writer. Yep. You know, somebody say, well, this is what I'm doing. This is how we do it. This is maybe how you could do it. And, and that's the, what we want to present here right. on Rogue Poets Studio here. I'm Bev Cam. 
We want to be able to present this to say, if you'd like to do this, you don't have to just dream. You can do. Yeah. And if... Go ahead. No, go ahead, brother. And if you ha you know, if someone has a story that they want to tell or has a book, you know, take the time, you know, take the time to write the story and message, you know, they can message us on Facebook and we can walk them through a little bit to do it. And, and if they don't want to talk to us, there's a million people, you know, there's a million people online that can help you with that. And there's a lot of tools that are available. Um, but if you just get the first book out, if you get a book out and it doesn't do what you, it doesn't have the result that you like, that's okay. You know, you can get the next book out, or you can refine it, or you can make it better, or you can try something different the next time. But if you got one book out and you tried it and you shot and adjust, you shoot and adjust, you know, that's, you know, that's, I think, what makes America great. I mean, that's what, what we tried, and we're, yeah. we've got our <clears throat> fourth book out now. What brings another great thing about a real writer, real artist, you know, even publisher. Yeah. It's not about, oh, we did this. It's like, well, we're putting this one out. Jack Powers, many, many years ago from Stone Soup in Cambridge, you know, we published him when we had Whale Magazine. Okay. So we brought him to Beverly and do a book signing. He gets up on stage and he's got the book we just, he just published. And then he goes, well, I, I was going to read this, but I, I got another poem I just wrote today. Can I read it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, because he was excited about the work he's doing yep. now. And I wish I could remember, I recently read a great article to writers from one of, one of those. Usually they just say, put this verb here, and I get them confused. But it was just saying, if you're going to write, do something good for yourself, say, uh, after I finish writing, you know, another thousand words, I'm going to go for a walk. Yeah. You know, I'm going to watch my favorite TV show. Yeah. Maybe I'll buy myself a couple magazines tomorrow after I finish this section. Because I'll be honest, I'm like, I'm like the donkey in the carrot. I mean, you got to kind of, you know, yeah. like. I, yeah, you have to do the work. I mean, I mean, for anything that's worth doing, it takes work. And, you, ha you know, Bruce doesn't just sit down and magically write a story. I've seen him work on a story, and he'll put it out, and he'll show it to me. And I was like, well, could you do this and this and this? And, and you know, I'm not a writer, so he probably yeah. throws half of it and away, which I'll is say, great. And that's not to count the amount of pages that I've written and then promptly hit delete on because I yeah. look at it and go, wow, I just, no, no. Yeah, yeah so no. it's, you that's know. That's the so, great thing, yep. too, today. you got the delete button. You exactly. Delete, and, you know, I always say it, you know, I wish real life had editors. I, oh. You know, like Chris Harvey here, he's a great dude, and we got Matt and Mike, and, you know, we, we got so many great people here. Yeah. You know, when I put my foot in my mouth, <laughs> these people are really good pulling it back out <laughs> without making me look really bad. You know what I mean? Sometimes I wish life had an edit button, you know what I mean? But unfortunately, it doesn't. Yeah, that would be great, wouldn't it? Now, do you like motorcycles? I love motorcycles. Love. I had okay. a motorcycle when I was in grade school. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, high school, a little Honda XR80. And then I, when I was in college, I bought a Honda CB200 and drove that for four years through engineering school. Wow. Loved it. Last week, recently, we were down to Cycles 128, my friend Mike Grosso, uh, Frank Grosso. We, I ended up interviewing him about some old Hondas. The first one, I don't know if you remember the Honda Dreams, the, the 150 and the 300 and the 305s. And okay. Yeah, we're going to watch that right now. Absolutely. Rock and roll. Here we are at Cycles 128 in Brimble Avenue in Beverly. And this was, shop's been here since 1975. Now, we're not trying to sell you anything, but we're going to tell you some history. And we got Frank Grasso here, who's been around motorcycle riding all doing? his life, right? Pretty what year much, did you start yeah. riding, Frank? Well, I started riding naturally, you know, little little bitty things <laughs> like that back when I was in single digits and uh, graduated up through the ranks uh, and uh, thank the good Lord I'm still riding today. Yeah, I mean it's just exciting. I find riding very exciting. Hopefully some of the folks out there do. Remember this is Road Poets Studio. The show invites you to the viewer to be on. So if you sing, dance, juggle pianos, tap dance across the live wire, a pogo stick across the crease on your roof, we want you to be on the show. And tonight, we've got to be out of here early because 
this is going to be Cycles 128 movie night. And this is going to be Any Sunday Part 2 tonight? Correct. Any it, Sunday Part 2, yeah. Great stuff. Great stuff. And we'd like to thank Rob Serendulo, Ralph Serendulo, and Jason Serendulo for letting us be here tonight. You know what I mean? This would be like gold. Thank you very much. Now, the first bike I want to look at here is this Honda 150. It's around a 1964. This is where it all began, isn't it, Frank? Pretty much. Uh, this is... Uh this is an evolution, actually. Uh, the first ones were the, uh, the step-throughs, yeah. and uh, that's when Honda really hit the American market big with the uh, You Meet the Nicest People campaign, and they had all the, the girls in the white leather skirts with the hats and all that, and they were all riding the step-throughs, very similar to that Yamaha over there. It was that design, and they were 70 cc's and 90 cc CT series. Now this dream over here, this represents the next evolution where they put a bigger motor in it, better suspension, bigger tires, the cantilevered front end with the uh, leading axle. And if you look at it, it's got what we used to call back in the day the cookie cutter frame. They stamped frames, they called them cookie cutters because they punched them out. And this was a big step forward for them. This model was uh, available with the, with the optional saddlebags. You could get a windshield for it. Uh, it would uh, do in the neighborhood of 60, 70 miles an hour. And this is actually the bike that the Beach Boys, Mike Love and Brian Wilson, they wrote the song, Go Little Honda, which was a hit. Now the Beach Boys, you have to remember, in the 60s, they were the number one band in the country, and they wrote a song about a Honda. So this was a very, very big step forward for Honda, and it represented at at that time pretty much cutting edge technology. Uh, it, the the uh, front brake system was advanced. The tires on it were much better. They offered the white walls for for a very sophisticated look. How many speed transmission does this have, Frank? This has a four speed transmission. That's what I thought, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was big doings then, because a lot of the British had, up until about 1961, had run, I believe, three speed transmission. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, and this was like having an extra gear. This, yeah. this was a great entry level bike, and this was actually the first bike that a lot of people owned. This was a very good entry level machine, and it was, at the time, priced uh, very right for the market. This was very popular with the college kids because on the short run, you could ride around town all day for a little bit of gas, and two people could ride on it if they were relatively light. Yeah. And of course, you could bring your beach gear with you. I love, look, look, look at that thing. Like, look at that speedometer. Just a nice, tight little fit. Everything is designed. The square headlight, check that square headlight out. But that's. This is stuff, everything else in America was basically uh, brought over here, was round. They started making square things. Now this is an electric start too. Yes it is. You, you imagine that, just that, just the little bike, electric start. These things were so good running, you just about had to just whistle out the window and they'd be waiting on you yeah. when you got out there. Yeah. It's, it was absolutely incredible. Now, I think this model was called a Benley, is that right? Benley, yeah. Ben, yeah, and that was one of the first ones because just the flare, yeah. just the flare of the fenders, the shape of the gas tank, you know, the, the, look at the square shock absorbers in the back. The, we're also gonna look at the 305, but everything here was really the beginning of the next bike we're gonna look at, and that signature tail light. Like I always say, there's more there's more plastic probably in a Bic lighter than there is in that tail light right there. But that was legal then. Now we have much bigger, because people got tired of getting run over because the brake lights weren't, lights weren't big enough. And two up seat, just, it's all, it's just in the handlebars, those stock handlebars on that. They are stock. Because those look really nice. They, I think we used to call those butterfly bars. That they shit. were very comfortable and uh, the Japanese were, were very uh, into, uh, integrating the look and, and making the ergonomics of, of all their machines uh, very uh, user-friendly. And the electric start that you mentioned earlier, uh, the British didn't come along until the 70s with that. 
was all kickstart. So they were they were way ahead of the British, and the British never saw them coming. Uh, to be honest with you, they the British never thought that they were ever going to take over any part of the American motorcycling market. And as it as it seems uh, back then, I mean, the British uh, marks now have seen a resurgence, but uh, for a long period of time, they were all dried up. Now, really, India Motorcycle Company never really saw the British coming. True. Uh, true. But, like you say, it was like, this is the one that did it. This yeah. is the one that captured the American heart at that time, the American youth. Now, next time we come on to the show, we're going to show you the 305. So thank you for being here. And remember, if you want to be in the show, just get a hold of us. Thank you. You know, I love motorcycles. I've always loved them since I was a kid. And I'd like to thank... Rob Cirandolo, his son Jason Cirandolo, and the, his dad, Ralph Cirandolo, for like letting us go down here and shooting that clip on the Cycles 128. And we'd like to thank Frank Grasso. And some night, hopefully, he'll be on the show to talk about some of the great bikes he's worked on and the things that he loves. You know what I mean? Yeah, it looks because, like they have some beautiful machines there. Oh, yeah. they do. Yeah. They do. Yeah, that's your next stage, drawing pictures of cars when they should get 16, right? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's always yeah. about first driving and first license. Uh, and, I'm, not know, re I'm not ready for that yet. Yeah, like well, you know, it yeah, happens it does. quicker than you think, I'll, be, I'll tell you. And, you know, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. And I'd like to thank you, and just in case... Thank you. Thank Jeff. you so much, Pedro. Thank you. It was great to have you Thank guys you on the show. Thank you very much, Pedro. It's a pleasure we're, being here. We're going to have you on the show again soon, I hope. Excellent. I'd love to do that. We'd now, love to be back. I'd just like to talk about these. Yes. These are flash drives. Can, now, check that out for a quick minute. And check that. Can you see any difference in those? Well, one appears blue and one appears red. Yeah. I mean, other than that, other than the color. Um, I cannot see anything without okay this is amazing because i figured it out these are hope these are the hope for mankind because i dropped this one in the parking lot at the library and then backed over it oh jeez <laughs> and it sat in the parking lot for 7 days in the rain the weather and i'm sure other people drove over it mm -hmm. and i found it i looked over and i said wow there's that flash drive and I picked it up. Of course, this was real bent, yeah. and this didn't work anymore. Yeah. And it's all chewed up if you look at it here. So I cleaned it out. Of course, this was bent too, and I cleaned it out. And I took it in, plugged it in, and it still works. Wow, that's amazing. Now, these are getting bigger and bigger all the time. Someday, they'll have these, like a gajillion, you know, rams on them. Yeah. So you can save every, a whole civilization will be saved on one of these, our technology, our history, and a few hundred, like, romance novels. Yeah. You know what I mean? And some scientists will do that and say, if anything ever happens to the planet Earth, we'll still have one of these. Yep. Keep, someone can find it. You know, and, and when all the headlights go out on the planet Earth, and there's nobody to turn them back on, two intergalactic salvages and archaeologists will land in a spacecraft. And they'll find one of those. And they'll be walking down the street in the rubble, lifeless, no one there, and one will go, oh, I, I know what this is. Remember that space capsule, the, the, the time capsule we found adrift a while ago? That's there was the one of these in it. I know what this is. It's a big lighter. <laughs> ah, the striker's gone. It won't ignite. It's not worth anything. We might as well toss it. <laughs> and that'll be the end of our history, and not to mention a couple hundred romance novels. Now, I hope you folks can tune in later, the next show, and we're really grateful you were here. I'd like to thank our crew because they're always great. And remember, we want you on the show. So if you sing, dance, juggle, piano, stop, dance, cross the stage, pogo stick across the live wire, you're going to be in these chairs. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.